We are coming to the final part of The Road to Nightfall, this episode, with the introduction of a character who will play enough of a major role in the Nightfall saga that it is my absolute surprise that this char- this storyline is not included in any of the omnibus collections of the storyline or any of the formal Nightfall reading lists. The introduction of Jason, of um, Tim Drake... The introduction of Venom, it's useful, but not 100% required. This is essential reading. This is kind of, it, it's not on the official Nightfall reading list, but it should be. It's, that's the only reason why this is, I'm calling this part of Road to Nightfall, as opposed to Nightfall Part 1. Specifically, I am referring to the introduction of Azrael, with the miniseries Batman, Sword of Azrael. The story is written by the legendary Danny O'Neill. From up before again, he's one of the greatest Batman scribes of all time. And drawn by a newcomer to Batman, but still a fairly well established name as of this recording. The legendary equally legendary Joe Casada. Inks by Kevin Noland, pencils by Ken Brusniak. Cut with colors by Laverne Kandirsky and ed- edited by Bill Kaplan and Archie Goodwin. Our story opens with Azrael giving a justice speech. And while I normally don't read lines from the comics in the videos, this is just too good not to, too good to skip. Know that men call you liar! Know that men call you betrayer! Know that men call you defiler! Therefore, it is the duty of the angel Azrael to bring you punishment. This awesome justice speech is immediately subverted by Azrael getting shot repeatedly through his body armor. He is saved from death by slashing his opponent, Carlton Leha, in the eye with his flaming sword and bursting through the window. That that said, things go from bad to worse from there, as he falls into the middle of the Gotham City Founders Day Parade, where he lands on his horse and presumably accidentally tramples two news anchors to death with said panicking horse in the process. Man, I feel like in superhero comics, on-the-site reporters and news anchors should get, like, hazard pay. You get called to be the -the on-the-spot reporter for a weather team for a freak weather occurrence. It turns out it's being caused by the weather wizard, and you nearly get a tree chunk through your torso. That sort of thing. Um, Just like... And this is just a Gotham thing. This is how happened comes up in Metropolis for anchors who aren't just, you know, (sighs) Lois Lane and Clark Kent. Uh, this comes up in Star City. You na- it comes up in New York. <laughs> it happens in Marvel Comics. It comes up with National Public Radio in Chris Claremont's run. So, I'm just saying, there should be, like, if you're doing in, out in the field work for reporting, you should be getting hazard pay. Like, just just gets a big pay spike, even for utterly innocuous things like covering a parade, especially for potentially utterly innocuous things like covering a parade, as we see in this issue. Asriel eventually reaches his son's apartment and tells him what happens and what to do next before dying. Now, we don't get the name of his son until literally the very last panel of the miniseries, so I'll just let slip his identity now. This man is Jean-Paul Valley. And I'm going to be calling him Jean-Paul, or occasionally Jean-Paul, for the rest of the book. On the way to the Batcave in Stately Wayne Manor, Bruce and Alfred discuss the events of the parade. More specifically, two pieces of information that caught Bruce's interest. One is reports of an angel falling from the sky from the penthouse apartment of arms dealer Carlton Leha, carrying a flaming sword. And then later, the angel discarding body armor that had repeatedly been shot through. Being clear, this angel is very much a man, and this man had possessed considerable strength of will. We then shift viewpoint characters again as we follow Jean-Paul as he travels to Switzerland, but he is not the narrator. Instead, the narrator is a man named Nomoz, who, along with a massive man named Heinrich, will train him in the system to turn him into an assassin like his father for the Order of Saint-Dumas. 
Back in Gotham, Batman goes looking for Azrael's sword and finds it with the seal of the Order of St. Dumas on the pommel, which he sends an image of to Oracle to investigate. Now, Oracle had previously appeared in issues of Suicide Squad, but had not shown up in the Bat books as yet, and I'm pretty sure that she hadn't, her identity had not been revealed as Barbara Gordon either. Meanwhile, back in Switzerland, Nomoz unlocks John Paul's hidden knowledge, while back in Gotham, Batman learns the real history of the Order of St. Dumas. In short, they are a splinter group of the Knights Templar who fell out with the main group back in the Crusades, Crusades in the process, managing to avoid that group's fate. Basically, taking the money, heading off and doing their own thing, but not being high-profile enough to actually be lumped in with the rest of the group when they all got rounded up and, you know, killed. Of the group, one of their number was appointed to be their enforcer and assassin, named Azriel. Bruce and Alfred head to Switzerland themselves to follow up on the lead of Jean-Paul Valley heading there as well, just in time to see Leha blow up the, mansion, the main building of the compound with a rocket launcher. Issue 2 opens with the destruction of the Order of St. Dumas Chalet, and in turn, Bruce and Alfred's helicopter being downed by the debris, as we learn through poetic and slightly overwrought narration from Bruce to Alfred. Now, Namaz and Jean-Paul are fine. They were tipped off by Bruce's helicopter, so Namaz shoved Jean-Paul into a fallout shelter before following shortly thereafter. Not so much with Heinrich, we never see him again. It's, he's probably dead, but we have no confirmation either way. On top of all of this, the explosion and crash triggered an avalanche and Bruce and Alfred weren't the only ones downed. Leha's escape chopper almost crashed as well, but the pilot managed to put it down safely, though it is in no condition to take off again. Leha gives thanks to his Dark Lord Biss for their survival, and shows his gratitude to his pilot by sacrificing him to the demon. Meanwhile, Bruce gives Alfred his parka before changing into an insulated bat suit, which he was wearing underneath his clothes, and just in time, as an high-tech hovercraft emerges from the ruins of the chalet, as Batman leaps on into action. Nemoz tells Jean-Paul to put on his helmet and go fight the Bat, in spite of Jean-Paul's protestations. My suspicion is Nemoz doesn't actually know who Batman is, and is just going by his appearance, while Jean-Paul, who has most recently been in Gotham, does know who Batman is and know he's, knows he's not a threat. Still, Nomoz insists, and Azrael obeys. Batman does try talking first, and ends up taking a punch for his troubles. Quickly getting serious, Batman handily disarms Azrael, forcing Nomoz to call Azrael to withdraw. After they leave, Batman and Alfred take advantage of this opportunity to descend into the base. However, after they do, Nomoz blows the base, or at least thinks he does. We don't see an explosion and Nomoz doesn't comment on the lack thereof. Presumably, I guess they're too far away. Elsewhere, Leha has reached civilization and has built himself a new a suit of armor modeled after the demon bees, Biz. Nomoz and Jean Paul have not been idle either, as they have upgraded the Azrael armor with gauntlets that have terrorist telescoping fl flaming punching daggers that they can also launch, along with improved body armor and an equally improved helmet. I really like the design of these armor, and, and I appreciate the layout, putting them two, both side by side. So we get to see how the armor evokes medieval knights, and it looks futuristic at the same time. With the coat of arms being displayed in bright colors over their body armor, like you'd see in a tournament or somewhat on the field of battle. We also learn about more about Leha from Nomoz, and through a point of view shift from Leha himself. Leha was the treasurer of the order and embezzled money in his arms business, in part because uh, Leha had abandoned his belief in St. Dumas in favor of his belief of Biss. However, uh, Leha provides all his exposition while naked and looking himself in the mirror while talking to Biss, because that's what, you know, mentally balanced and stable people do. Meanwhile, Batman and Alfred are still very much alive in the very much intact fallout shelter. The connection from the detonator to the bombs was disconnected by the earlier explosion and avalanche. 
This leaves Batman with the satellite phone in the shelter, which in turn allows him to find a list of locations where Lee Hawk could be going next. Namaz and Jean-Paul also go looking for other members of the Order. As the treasurer, Lee Ha was one of the few who knew where all of the members of the Order were located. Unfortunately, Lee Ha went and called up the other members of the Order, who weren't aware of his treachery, in advance to warn them not to speak to anyone before they speak to him. Jean-Paul and Nomos head to a hospital in Germany where an elderly member of the Order is located, one of the few who couldn't have gotten the message, but arrived too late. Li Ha and his biz garb got there first, and proceeds to gun down a nurse and the bailed ridden old man, and also seemingly Azrael. Issue number three opens with Bruce and Alfred seeing Jean-Paul fall, so Bruce has Alfred tend to him, while Bruce pursues Li Ha himself, since he doesn't have time to fully change into his bat suit. Bruce makes it up to the window just in time to see Li Ha try to shoot Namaz, only for his gun to jam. Nomos tries to trip up Bruce to stop him from pursuing, but to no avail. Bruce pursues Lee Ha into a storage room, but Lee Ha spills a bottle of ether to throw Bruce off balance and overpower him. Lee Ha tries to abduct Bruce and barely succeeds, despite a few freak moments of poor luck and attempted intervention by Alfred. This forces, this forces Alfred, Sean Paul, who survived because basically the costume was in the bag, and the overlapping um, body armor absorb the bullets, and Nemoz to team up to rescue Bruce. Meanwhile, Leha has done the thing that no Batman villain has done before, stripped down Bruce pretty much all the way, and determined his, Bruce, his true identity, and is planning to torture him in order to get his money. I'm pretty sure even Rachel Ghoul left Bruce with his mask. Elsewhere, Nomoz wants to kill Alfred, but Jean-Paul talks him down, and Alfred makes it clear that his ties to Batman make him useful for their goal to track down and stop Leha. Leha proceeds to the next person on his list while bringing in outside help to break Bruce. Meanwhile, with some deductive reasoning and detective work, Alfred and Jean-Paul determine that Leha is headed to the UK next. They head there, but Leha reached his target first, and now he's wearing Batman's costume. The final issue of the story opens with Leha slaughtering the guards on the way to the compound, much to Alfred's horror, horror that is eclipsed only by seeing that Leha has committed his latest murder while wearing the bat suit. Leha escapes, and Alfred, Jean-Paul, and Nomaz then trace Leha to an oil refinery in Texas, which is where Leha is holding Bruce. While being held prisoner, Bruce manages to goad on Leha, probably to a degree that backfired, or at least he perceives it as backfiring, as Leha proceeds to strip naked and come after Bruce with the intent to kill him. What is it with the 90s and naked psychopaths? In any case, he is stopped by Azrael bursting in and giving the justice speech, which is still great, and this time is without the anticlimactic interruption. Leha opens, blindly in opens fire blindly in response, which is in turn diverted by uh, Azrael shooting one of his flaming blades into his shoulder, which causes him to his bullets to sp spray all over the place and set the facility on fire. Against Nomoz's protestations, Azrael cuts Bruce free and saves him from the conflagration as the building is consumed and presumably Leha with it, except we don't see a body and clearly no one could survive this, therefore he's not dead. The story ends with Jean-Paul unmasking and giving Bruce and Alfred his real name. Sword of Azrael is a very solid introduction to the character, does a good job of giving basically a lead-in to who Jean-Paul is and why he's joining the Bat family. But it, what it doesn't do is, with where it leaves him here, it doesn't set up why Bruce makes the decision that he does later on with Jean-Paul to pass the mantle of the Bat onto him. A future storyline will explain part of the reason why he's going to consider passing on the mantle beyond just, you know, Bane breaking his back, but not why to John Paul Valley. That said, this may become a little more clear over the course of the Nightfall storyline. When we return, we get into the formal start of Nightfall of the Nightfall saga with the introduction of 
Bane. It's a one. It's a single issue, but it'll have a lot to unpack. So we'll be covering that then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.